what I'm going to talk about today is the question that uh, you see on the slide right here about what data feminism actually means or looks like in action. And I'm going to talk to you about a book that I should begin by acknowledging um, was co-authored work by myself and Catherine D'Amnesio. You can see a picture of her up on the screen. Um, She's an associate professor of urban science and planning at MIT. And if you're curious about any of the material that I talk about today, you should also know that the book is available open access via the URL at the bottom of the slide, so datafeminism.io. And so the roadmap for today is a brief summary of the book's theoretical framework, um, sort of what we were thinking about when we decided to write the book, what compelled us to take action by writing the book. And I'm gonna go through that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the book is structured and then move on to a set of examples of work, some of which we describe in the book, some of which that has taken place since writing the book that we feel illustrates these principles of data feminism in action. So just to get started, uh, the motivating premise of our book is that in the world today, you know, data is really powerful, right? Um, we all know the ways in which data and data science and data systems have been used for real benefit, um, you know, to advance medical discovery, to attempt to curtail misinformation, to call attention to harms at scale. Um, but it's also resulted in significant harms at scale. Um, you know, I think at this point, we're all familiar with the examples of, for example, facial recognition software and how it works and is effective um, disproportionately on the basis of different skin colors, as well as how the evidence of facial recognition software is wielded disproportionately against only specific groups. Um, there have been large scale exposés of the gender biases and resume screening software. You know, at this point, we all have these examples that are reported on nearly every week um, about the ways in which data driven systems intended for good end up being wield, wielded for a tremendous harm. And what we try to dig into in the book is the reason for this. Um, and the reason we believe is that the people who are making decisions about how to design and deploy these data systems, these people tend to come from a very small and homogenous group. Um, they have a lot of resources, both financial, but also technical. Um, and usually what they're thinking about are the benefits to the institution themselves, as opposed to the expenses or harms of everyone at the receiving end of the systems that they design. So what we identify in sort of how we frame the, the opening of the book is this unequal power um, between the designers of data systems and those who experience their effects. And our intervention is to show how feminism is also about power. Um, for many, many years, feminism and intersectional feminism in particular has been focused on precisely the issue that we're seeing play out in data science right now. These imbalances of power and the structural forces that cause them. You know, we see different and newer formulations of this. For example, right now people talk a lot about AI systems being brittle. Um, by which they mean these are systems that have been optimized for certain situations or certain groups of people, but not others. Um, we also hear the idea a lot that our training data is biased, right? And that biases in the training data end up being amplified and accelerated by these predictive models. Um, so these are new manifestations of a very old set of ideas. So the basic idea that systems, you know, not necessarily technical systems, but social systems, are optimized for certain groups and not others. You know, this is not news to feminists. Um, the idea that, you know, not even only the scientific record, but the cultural record more broadly, that, you know, these biases are kind of baked in, you know, this has been a topic of feminist scholarship, you know, for decades. And so what we try to do in the book is make the connections between how feminist theorists and feminist activists have identified um, and explained these problems and the way in which we find parallels in the data science world. Um, and then the second thing we do is not only to try to identify the problems, but to explain how 
feminists and feminism has been just as much invested in solutions to some of these problems, rebalancing these power differentials. And so um, a large component of the book is explaining how feminism can help us get out of the mess that has been created and accelerated by our, our increasing reliance on data science and data systems. But I wanna back up a little bit um, before I dig deeper into the argument that we make in the book, um, which is about why data science really needs feminism very badly. I just wanna do some very basic level setting about what we mean by feminism. So in the book, we present three related definitions of the term. So first, feminism at its core entails a belief in equality for all genders. So this includes both cis and trans women, as well as men and non-binary folks. But it's really important to recognize, if you take a look around you, that this aspirational goal of equality has not yet been realized in the world. And so feminism also, and again, necessarily involves organized activity on behalf of women and non-binary people to make this goal of equality the reality. And we can talk a little bit more about what this activity should entail later, um, because you know not all action on behalf of gender equality has the same impact, right? So some very narrowly focused activism aimed at elevating certain individual women to the ranks of sort of already powerful men. This actually can result in significant harm, um, but I'll come back to that. What I wanna be sure to introduce now on this slide is the third definition, which has to do with these set of theories and ideas. And it's important to underscore that these theories might have begun by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender. But over the past 40 years or so of feminist scholarship, you know, coupled with the current political reality, um, these have brought up sort of introduced many, many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation. So we need to be thinking also, in addition to gender, about um, questions of race, questions of ethnicity, questions of nationality, position in the world, economic class, um, ability, sexuality, and more. So this brings me back around to the idea of intersectional feminism. And again, this may be a term that is familiar to some people, but it's important to be clear that this is a term that comes to feminism broadly from the specific work of women of color feminists and black feminists in particular. And what feminism has really learned uh, from the intersectional feminist uh, movement, uh, what feminists has gained are really important concepts. So you can think about the Kambahi River Collective's formulation of what they describe as, quote, interlocking systems of oppression, um, Kimberly Crenshaw's term intersectionality, Patricia Hill Collins's idea of the matrix of domination. What all of these ideas and concepts and frameworks are, um, they're frameworks that help structure critiques of power. So if you go back to this question of why we have these unequal systems of power being made manifest in our data science projects, um, what you can learn from these frameworks or what these frameworks help point to are the reasons why certain people experience unequal power, which results in oppression on the one hand, or if you're on the, the positive side of unequal power, privilege on the other. And the intersection and intersectionality, this just comes from the view that it's not possible to isolate certain forces of privilege or oppression from each other, right? So we might be interested in the effects of gender inequality, for example, but we always need to be recognizing that other forces um, like racism, like ethnocentrism, like classism, like colonialism, all of these interlock and intersect with each other in ways that are truly impossible to separate. And more than that, um, in ways that compound their effects. So that's a little bit about the sort of conceptual framework for the book. And what we actually do in the book is use the teachings of intersectional feminism, uh, along with some other ideas from different areas of feminist thinking in order to arrive at these seven principles for doing more ethical and equitable data science. So you can see them right here. They're examine power, challenge power, rethink binaries and hierarchies, elevate emotion and embodiment, embrace pluralism, consider context and make labor visible. And our goal with these principles was really to, in a way, to operationalize feminism. So to provide a very clear set of principles for people who are currently working with data 
Um, for people who want to work with data, this includes you know, students as well as community organizations, um, community members themselves, um, and also importantly for people who want to refuse to work with data for ideological reasons. And in the book, we have one chapter devoted to each of the principles. We talk a little bit about the theory that underlies that particular principle, and then we illustrate how it can be applied to data science through a lot, a lot of examples. But I'm actually not in the remainder of this talk going to go through all the chapters in order. What I'm going to do instead is just pull out a couple of examples, like I said before, um, some from the book, some more recent than the book that bring together a lot of these ideas and that illustrate these principles in action. One of the projects that we talk about very early on in the book um, and that I really, you know, really think is so important to talk about every single time I present on this work because it's so foundational to our thinking is this one. Um, it's an artwork, an art project by Mimi Onwoha. It's called The Library of Missing Data Sets. Um, and so what you're seeing on the screen is actually two versions of the same thing. Um, the first is just a GitHub repository. You can Google it, um, Library of Missing Data Sets on GitHub. And it just lists the missing data sets that you can see here screenshotted on the right. Um, this artwork, I should say, you know, it was created pre-COVID, but I think one of the things that COVID has done for us is made the important the importance of data data collection, but also called our attention to uh, missing data. It's made us realize why data collection matters. Um, and it's made us realize the, all of the different reasons why uh, data collection does not happen in certain contexts, right? It happens be because certain governments decide not to collect data on a particular issue because they do not want a record of that particular incident. Um, it may not be intentional. They might not just recognize a particular issue as important enough to collect data on. Um, and then there's also data that is incomplete or messy or sort of too hard to derive inferences about because um, it just hasn't been collected in any sort of uh, intentional, structured, uh, you know, formulaic way. And in the, all the conversations about COVID and its impact and its reach across the world, we saw instances of every single type of this missing data um, play out. So in any case, I sort of want to not lose sight of the artwork itself and just explain to you what you're looking at. Um, the second way to encounter this artwork is as a physical installation. Um, that's the file cabinet that you see on the left. And the idea is that you walk into the gallery, you see this cabinet with file folders, you read the names of the data sets on the tabs. Um, you go to open one that you think seems interesting or important or worth learning more about. But when you open it, you discover that the folder is empty. So in this version of the piece, the data sets are physically missing. And like I was talking about before with respect to uh, COVID data, the point that Onuoha is trying to make here is that these data sets, they're missing for a reason. And if you want to abstract the reason why these data sets are missing, they have to do with this imbalance of power again, right? Um, and the imbalance of power more specifically directed to um, the capacity for data collection in the world today, right? So this imbalance of power is ultimately what determines what data are collected and what are not. And then very crucially, what research can be conducted on the basis of that data and what research cannot. And then the third part of that is like what policy decisions or policy recommendations can be made on the basis of the research, on the basis of the data, um, and then what cannot be. And so this all starts with data that is collected or not collected, and what those data sets can subsequently enable. Um, you know, who has the ability to determine which data sets are collected? Generally speaking, it's governments, it's well-resourced institutions. Um, and generally speaking, again, minoritized groups do not have the ability to collect these kinds of data at scale. And so this is why a feminist approach to data science really needs to begin with this analysis of power because far too often the data sets that we can access and then these research questions and policy recommendations that they enable, these are sort of overdetermined by the imbalance of power um, in the world. So um, what to do about it? One of the examples that we talk about in the book has to do with the issue of feminist side, um, which is a very profound case 
of missing data. Um, and so in the book, we tell the story of Maria Salguero. Um, she's a Mexican citizen who resolved to head straight towards this problem of missing data and collect it herself. So um, just to back up, just for some context, so feminicides, there are gender-related killings of women and girls. Um, they include both cis and trans women. Um, they take place worldwide and they are legally defined as crimes in a number of countries, um, including Mexico, where Maria Salguero lives. Um, but in this case, and in many cases, the state does not systematically collect data on feminicides, and so the rules on the books cannot be enforced. And frustrated um, in her own country by this lack of formal action, Salguero has single-handedly over the course of years compiled what's become the single largest data set of feminicides in Mexico. Um, she's done this over the course of years, as I mentioned, two to four hours per day, and it's a very manual process. Um, she reads media reports, and then she marks the information that they record on a Google map. But this data set itself has become very, very powerful. She's helped families locate loved ones. Um, it's served as data for data journalists and NGOs. She's somewhat ironically been called in to testify in front of Mexicans, Mexico's Congress multiple times because she, a private citizen, has more information about this problem that the government is seeking to intervene in. Um, and so this is what we talk about in the book as a form of feminist counter data. So this is activist data collection that steps in when the state and other institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic safety of their population. And this represents one way to use data to challenge power. So I just wanted to call a uh, brief attention to uh, my co-author Catherine's new work with the Data Against Feminicide Project, um, which is working to bring together activists across all of Latin America, as well as the Caribbean and really beyond, who are working together through similar methods on the issue of feminicide. Um, and there's a couple of things to note about this work. Um, the first is the fact that there are multiple people undertaking this work all over the world. And this is something that we learned in the process of conducting research for data feminism, um, that it wasn't just individuals like Maria Salguero, but there were people like her in a lot of different places. Um, the other thing that we realized in the course of doing the research for this and that Catherine has really continued to pursue is that collecting data is not always the default uh, intervention. Sometimes in some context, an informed decision is made not to collect data. And that's really important because we do not want the takeaway from what I've said thus far to be that the intervention is always to collect data on an issue as the solution. It's not that easy. And in many cases, collecting data can actually bring increased harm or increased attention or increase the vulnerability of certain populations that um, are experiencing a particular issue or a situation. So that part, um, is really important. And then the third thing, and this is going to take me um, to the next set of examples that I want to talk about, is the importance of embracing pluralism in any data science project. So this means uh, placing a priority on listening to the people who are actually doing the work, um, in this case, these feminicide activists, and learning about them, uh, or rather learning about them, but also learning from them about what tools they actually need in order to further their own commitment. So not coming in from the outside, um, but rather listening and learning and figuring out how our own efforts as data scientists can supplement um, and enhance the work that is already being done. And so I'm going to turn to another example or um, set of examples that illustrate this right now. So um, this is a project, it's another longstanding project. Um, it's been going on since 2013, and it has to do with the problem of evictions in the United States and in San Francisco and the Bay Area in particular, which is where Silicon Valley is located. Um, and because of the incursion of highly paid tech workers in the Bay Area, there's been a real epidemic of eviction um, in this place. It's sort of coupled with really restrictive zoning laws, which means that new housing is very hard to be built in this, in this area. And uh, since 2013, this group called the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project has worked in collaboration with tenants rights organizations and community groups in the Bay Area in order to collect and map data on this problem. So more concretely, what you're looking at on this map um, is uh, little, these little red dots. These are places where people or families 
or households have been evicted from their homes. And then those blue dots that you see indicate places where they've also been interviewed. And what you're seeing um, in the screenshot is that one of these interviews with one of the residents of a place um, called Midtown in San Francisco, um, who's in, unfortunately in the process of being evicted. And in the book, what we try to do is draw a contrast between that map and the work of the eviction lab, which is based at Princeton University. So these are actually two sort of parallel projects, right? And they're both really worthwhile. Um, the eviction lab's goal, as you can see, is to pre present a national picture of the eviction crisis. Um, and like I said before, you know, it's an incredibly worthy project. They are both really valuable, but the contrast that we draw out is in terms of process. Um, and also I should say sort of in terms of assumptions and presumptions about the quality um, and the scale of what we can learn from these differently seeming uh, data science projects. So taking a quick look at this map, it seems like they're using bigger data, right? We're certainly looking at a broader geographic expanse. Um, we might think it's a little bit more uh, rigorous, you know, on the basis of this looking like a sort of a cleaner design, a more polished website versus the Google map that was used in the previous one. But very crucially, um, the AEMP has shown that these national real estate databases, like the one that the eviction lab uses, they significantly undercount evictions. Um, and this has to do with the incentives, again, these sort of power differentials. You know, if it's the real estate industry, the people doing the renting, um, collecting the data, they are not incentivized to collect any more data on evictions than they have to. It's really bad for their business, right? Um, and then you can also think just, uh, you know, on another facet of this, all of the ways in which you can be forced out of your home that sort of don't count in a legal definition of eviction, right? And this comes into play in a lot of different issues, um, domestic violence, um, you know, all sorts of things in terms of, you know, compensation for labor. There's all sorts of um, types of issues that their impact and the experience of them is much broader than what is actually counted in a legal or a formal definition of that thing. But because the data of the AEMP is drawn from people who come to these community-based organizations and say, help me, this is what's happening to me. What that Google map shows us is actually a more detailed and more accurate picture, um, as well as a more contextualized picture of what is actually happening um, on the ground. And Ultimately, this documents a greater extent of the problem. Um, and so this is a really important lesson. It shows what can be gained by embracing pluralism, which again is often, in spite of first glance, a deeper, more contextualized, more accurate, and ultimately more rigorous account of what is happening in a community. So just another example of this that comes that we don't mention in the book because it's a newer project, um, but also has to do with the importance of listening to people in a particular community or in a particular location um, and centering their knowledge in the design process. Um, this example comes from the group policy and what they do is use feminist methods combined with data collection and analysis in order to make policy recommendations. So here you see a project on women's data practices in sub-Saharan Africa. And very crucially with this project, before making any recommendations, they partnered with local feminist groups to learn from them what the issues actually were, um, enlisted the groups in designing the surveys for the women in their communities and only at, in the end synthesize the responses into recommendations that have been sourced sort of you know from the ground up. And so just to sort of generalize, you know, if you see here, this is sort of what a participatory process for data science might look like. It doesn't mean looking at the middle of the sort of normal distribution, the people right in the middle who represent the mean or the average user or person or community member. It means looking to the margins and centering those because the people who are at the margins of policy, um, of sort of broader community frameworks, these are the ones who can tell us the most about how normative systems are working and how they are not. So the previous examples have really focused on issues of power with respect to people. So they've been all about people who have power and then on the other side, um, people who don't. But another major idea that comes from feminism relates more to conceptual structures of power and more specifically binary structures that are defined by a hard distinction between groups. So feminist theory has helped to show how 
these binary distinctions, they're usually hiding a hierarchy underneath with one group on the top and the other on the bottom. And very crucially, um, once you see the hierarchy, you start to understand the reason why that hard line between the groups, the dividing line, is there in the first place. And this line is there is ordered to ensure that the group that is on top stays on the top, right? And that the group on the bottom can't come up and sort of take power from those who already have it. So, you know, as you can see from the slide, the distinction between the idea of, you know, man and woman, this is the obvious reference point. This was the starting point for this critique of these sort of hidden hierarchies and false binaries. Um, and it's a very clear example of both, right? There are more than two genders and among them, no gender is better than any others. Um, but one of the key moves of feminist theorists is to take this critique of the gender binary and to use it to question other binaries and hierarchies that we encounter in the world. So the distinction between nature and culture, um, between teacher and student, or the example that I'm going to talk about next, which is this artificial and hierarchical distinction between reason and emotion. One of the things that sort of we've been taught in the sort of Anglo-Western context broadly, but in technical spaces and more specifically, we've been taught that reason is better than emotion, right? And we see this, we see this play out in data and in data science all the time. And it's very, very clear in data visualization. So just think about what best practices for visualization might be, you know, like a clean design, uh, minimalist aesthetic presenting only the facts. Um, but the interesting thing is that Research in this same field, uh, data visualization, has shown that we interpret these aesthetic choices just as emotionally. So we tend to believe that these types of charts are actually more truthful than they actually are. So you can see some of the sources for this on the slide, but there's tons of work in the space that says that, look, you know, people are more than like eyeballs attached to brain stalks. We respond to things through all of our modes of perception and modes of meaning making um, and not just only one of them. So a feminist approach here would say, well, let's, you know, lean into this. Let's think about visualizations that intentionally leverage emotion in order to change minds. Um, and this is what the next, and I think will end up being the last example will help us explore. Uh, what you're looking at here are actually screenshots of an animated visualization. So it's a has to do with gun violence in the United States. And what you're looking at is the number of gun related deaths in uh, this country, my country, um, in a single calendar year. And what happens is each of the people killed by a gun in that year is represented by a single arc. Um, so the arcs are traced one by one onto the screen. They start out really slow, um, but then they get faster and faster until they, you know, it's the information is coming at you so quickly that you can no longer perceive the individual data points. Visually, they also start to overlap and intersect with each other. So you can't pick out the individual arcs um, on the screen. And, you know, I find it really overwhelming to watch. It's emotionally unbearable. And, but that, like, that's the point, right? Um, you know, it goes on for too long because too many people are being killed by guns in the United States. Too many deaths are being plotted. There's too much detail, but that's because too many people are being killed, right? Um, and the important thing to underscore is that methodologically, it's no less statistically sound than any other study. So it's not misrepresenting the data, right? That's a very crucial point. Um, you know, the data about the people, they come from a national crime data set released by the federal government. Um, one of the, the lifespans are determined using a uh, statistical model released by the World Health Organization. Um, but people in the visualization community really didn't like it because it did activate our emotions. But a feminist approach here would say, you know, that's not a problem at all that it made us feel things. And it's actually a more effective visualization because it intentionally brings emotion into the data communication pipeline, right? So rebalancing this, you know, false binary between reason and emotion, sort of tipping it over and smushing it together, this opens us up to focus on what really matters in a design process, you know, honoring context, listening to experience, and taking action to challenge the imbalances of power that we encounter in the world. So I'm just gonna wrap up now um, and make one final point, and it's probably already obvious from these examples, but it's that data feminism, it insists on an expanded definition of data science, and you could sort of carry that forward to AI, right? Um, you know, our data science isn't defined by the size of the data set, the credentials of the people undertaking the work, um, you know, 
the methods, uh, you know, the technical sophistication of the methods, because these concerns are continually used to discount work that makes contributions that are socio-technical rather than purely technical, as well as to discount pre uh, pre uh, predominantly women and people of color, um, you know, who may not have as many of these technical credentials uh, to discount their work from the field. But if we expand our definition of data science, that what we can see is that there is a lot of really amazing work taking place right now. And it's being undertaken by artists, by journalists, by humanists, by community organizers, by activists. Um, and some of this work you know, does look like traditional data science. So we have some screenshots of this right here, but it can also be artwork, um, like the artwork that I began with presenting today. It can also be a mural in a community. It can also be a fun data journalism exploration um, that you know, is intended to captivate viewers on the web. You know, All of these types of projects matter and all of these can have impact. And in the book, you know, if you're interested, again, you can go take a look. We have hundreds of, of examples like this. And, you know, there have been hundreds of more that have come out even since then. And each of these, I think, can provide us with inspiration because, you know, if we want to go back to where I started with today, um, we can recognize that data is at the root of so many problems, but it can also help be part of the solution if we take this more expansive, more capacious, and more intentional view of data science um, as our starting point and imagine the future from there. So that's all I have to say in terms of my formal remarks. Thanks so much for listening. And if you have further questions or ideas or thoughts, these are some ways to get in touch with us. Thank you so much.